Welcome. Welcome to the porch here on Firefall Talk Radio. I'm Richard Grund. This is where we get back to basics, the red letter basics, examining the Word of God and especially the example of the book of Acts Church to see how the early church served the Lord. We dig deeper into Scripture. We take a hard look at the Word to find out what it means and how to apply it. And by doing so, I believe we find the book of Acts Church, the one that the Lord intended, not the one that man created. The porch is about restoring the priesthood of the believer and regaining the world-shaking influence that the early church had. We believe the church age is still in effect. The day of Pentecost is ongoing. The fire still falls. It's there if you want it. If you have any questions, go to firefalltalkradio.com. Use the contact button or write us directly at the porch, lowercase one word, at firefalltalkradio.com. You want to support what we do? There are ways to do that. Go to the main page of the Firefall Talk Radio website. Pray and give as the Lord leads. We appreciate the support and encouragement of each and every one of you who do. And welcome to all of our listeners from the various streaming platforms. Quick little announcements. A new email list is being created for the newsletter. We're changing the place that does our newsletters. So let us know if you want to be on it. If you're not on it, one will be going out from the old platform to get people to update their choices, whether they want to receive the emails or not. Remember, if you need prayer, you want to pray for others in the porch community, just let us know. In fact, I do have a prayer request I want to offer. It's from Woody in Central Florida. Found out this week that his dad needs heart bypass surgery tomorrow, Thursday. Please pray for Woody's father's health, for a successful surgery, and for speedy recovery. Lord, you know all of our needs even before we ask, but you told us to come into agreement, to come together, to pray, to praise, to intercede. So we thank you. We thank you for making us a family. We thank you for being your children. You are our Abba Father, our Papa God, our Daddy. We thank you for loving us when we were unlovable for caring so much for us that you made a way when there was no way, and that way was Yeshua. That way was the cross. That way was the blood. We thank you, Lord, for enduring the shame, enduring the pain, and doing what you did so that we could be set free. We could be restored into right relationship with our Heavenly Father. So thank you. Thank you for sending back the Holy Spirit your Ruach HaKodesh, to guide us, to teach us, to explain us, to convict, explain to us and convict us, and to convict the world. So we ask you to bless the technology, guard and guide our hearts and our minds. Let us receive what you want us to receive. Lord, I pray that your children, who need to hear from you, will, who need a touch from you, will get it. Who need a healing will receive it. Who need a blessing will see it manifest into their lives so that they can be a living testimony to the reality that you are the great I am and you are the one who answers prayer. So Holy Spirit, have your way. Do as you will. And we ask you to do exceedingly and above anything we could think or imagine in Yeshua's name. Amen. These lessons are proprietary information, except where noted the information comes from outside sources. The combination of that information, the matter presented, is exclusive, cannot be repeated or used without permission. The date of this broadcast serves as the registered date of the following information. 
So tonight, we're going to be talking about the Bible. My wife says to me, what are you teaching this week? The Bible. But tonight we have a specific topic, one that she brought up the other day. And I felt we really needed to talk about it because I'm seeing elements of it rear its ugly head again, and it's called the Great Apostasy. So open your Bibles. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Start with verse 1. Going to be a lot of scripture, a lot of teaching tonight. Hopefully I'll get it all done. But I see this being another week or two afterwards. So please take notes, download, follow along. Let the word seep in. Feast on it. Eat it. Let it get into you. It's going to be needed in the days ahead. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Messiah had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and that he is a capital H. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Hasatan, Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Lots to cover here. We're going to break things down, but the Holman Bible Dictionary says apostasy is the act of rebelling against, forsaking, abandoning, or falling away from what one has believed. That's the falling away mentioned there in verse 3. In the Old Testament, it's referred to rebellion against the king spiritual unfaithfulness, and backsliding. In the New Testament, the English word apostasy is derived from the Greek word apostasia, which means to stand away from. So, in this chapter of Second Thessalonians, Paul is dealing with members of the church that had been deceived into believing that the day of the Lord had already come. And he taught that an apostasy would precede the day of the Lord. In 1 Timothy 4, one, he mentions it again. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, fall away, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Such apostasy involves doctrinal deception, moral insensitivity, and ethical departures from God's Word. Now, the book of Hebrews speaks of falling away from the living God because of an evil heart of unbelief, chapter 3, verse 12, that those who fall away cannot be renewed again to repentance, Hebrews 6, 6. But yet Jude says in verse 24 that God can keep the believer from falling. Now, to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And that was written by Jude, the half-brother of Yeshua, 
It was written between 65 and 80 A.D. That's really soon after the resurrection and ascension. Now, why did he write that? Well, Jude is warning believers about false teachers that had slipped in, that were trying to convince them that being saved by grace gave them a license to sin. Believers were already being misled by false teachers. And nothing has changed. If you back up into Jude verses 3 and 4, he told you to contend for the faith. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation, I find it necessary to write you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were mocked out for this condemnation ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus the Messiah. So apostasy is a biblical concept, but the implications of this have really been um, hotly debated. Larry and I were talking about the various views And the debate centers on the issue of apostasy and salvation. Based on God's sovereign grace, some hold that true believers may stray, they may backslide, but they would never totally fall away. Others believe that if they did fall away, they were never really saved. They were never born again. And though they may have believed for a while, they never experienced regeneration, being transformed as by the Holy Spirit. And still others argue that the biblical warnings against apostasy are real and that believers maintain the freedom, at least potentially, to reject God's salvation. I can only go by what was written. And it would appear that Paul is saying that there are some who will fall away. There are indications in the Bible of people that have made a confession— but never truly been transformed, never been changed. People worried about apostasy should recognize that the conviction of sin in and of itself is evidence that one has not fallen away. If the Spirit can convict you, then he's still working in you. If your heart has been hardened and your conscience seared and there is no conviction, well, then we have a problem. So, basically, apostasy is divorce from your marital vows to the Lord. It's broken vows. Second Peter chapter 2, starting verse 13, talking about people like this, talking about those that act like that, will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness." If we look at the writings, we see that this became an issue almost immediately, and Satan began to attack. He began to put the seeds of doubt. He began to do like with the serpent in the garden. Did God really say? Did the Lord really say? Mine's complete expository expository dictionary of Old and New Testament words says apostasy is a defection. It's a revolt. I see many believers defecting and revolting from the Word, even from the Lord himself. So let's dig in here. Let's go back to Second Thessalonians. But relative to the coming of our Lord Jesus the Messiah and our gathering together to meet him, we beg you, brethren, not to allow your minds to be quickly unsettled or disturbed or kept excited or alarmed, whether it be by some pretended revelation of the Spirit 
or by word or by by letter alleged to be from us. Obviously, somebody was putting out false writings with the, the apostle's name on it to the effect that the day of the Lord has already arrived and is here. Let me stop you. There are people right now that are teaching this, that the day of the Lord has already come. This apostasy has been in full effect for almost 2,000 years. Let no one deceive or beguile you in any way, for that day will not come except the apostasy comes first, unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be believers in Messiah has come, and the man of lawlessness, the man of sin, is revealed, who is the son of doom, the son of perdition. This is a real person. This is not a spirit. This is not an attitude. He's talking about a real person. He's This person is prophesied about in Daniel. There are examples of him in other parts of the Old Testament. In Daniel 7, verse 25, he says of this person, And he shall speak words against the Most High God, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change the time of the sacred feast and holy days and the law. And the saints will be given into his hand for a time, two times and a half time, which is three and a half years, which is the second half of the tribulation. Daniel 8.25, And through his policy he shall cause trickery to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart and mind. And in their security he will corrupt and destroy many. He shall also stand against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken, and that by no human hand. See, broken vows have to begin somewhere. They begin with seduction. Now this individual, and the end result of this apostasy, which is I'm laying out the bigger picture here, because I believe we're on the verge of many events that are going to happen over the next couple of years, maybe over the next weeks or months, I don't know, that we're going to see elements of this begin to manifest. Revelation 13, first one. Remember I said a lot of scripture here. You're not going to be able to keep up. Download. Follow along. Take notes. Revelation 13, verse 1. And then I stood on the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Blasphemous name. Now the beach beast, woo, the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, who was able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And all authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. John the Revelator is painting a picture. He's painting a prophetic picture. Now, the thing about Revelation for me is it's not linear. It just is. It's time. And he's telling you what he's seeing. Jumping down to Revelation 19, verses 19 through 20. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. 
And then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. I do not believe that this is symbolic. I've seen the visions. I've seen what the Lord has shown me. I believe this is real. This is really going to happen. And the church will not be a part of it. We will be spectators. It's all done by the Lord. Remember, it says, by no human hand, by the word that comes from his mouth. And the end result, Revelation 20.10, and the adversary, the devil, who deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verses 14 and 15, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone who is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, 8, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There are people right now, and have been for the last decade, teaching that there is no hell, there is no lake of fire, that the Bible never taught about it, and the Lord never spoke about it. Wrong. I just read you multiple scriptures, but did the Lord ever say anything about the lake of fire? Hmm, Matthew twenty five forty one. Then he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Mark nine forty two through forty four, in talking about protecting the little ones, but whoever causes one of the little ones who believe in me to stumble, and this he's not talking about children, children, he's talking about young believers, whoever causes these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would have been better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell in the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now I've got twice, Matthew 25, Mark 9. What about Matthew 18? If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It's better for you to enter into life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into the hellfire, which in the Greek is Gehenna, the place of punishment for the dead. What about Matthew 10:28? Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Eternal judgment, lake of fire, a place created for Satan and his angels, is the end result of of this rebellion, prophesied, taught by the disciples, spoken about by the Lord. Even the prophet Isaiah, in talking about the new millennial after the Lord comes for, for as the new heavens and the new earth. This is Isaiah 66, I'm sorry, verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I shall make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, Backing up, rewinding, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah 66, starting with verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass, pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, All flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. And they shall go forth and look 
upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm does not die, and their fire is not quenched. They shall be in abhorrence to all flesh. Pretty serious stuff here. That's why I think this topic is important. The Nelson Study Bible for the New King James Version says, transgressed, this word transgressed means rebelled against God. These people rebelled against God. And the imagery presented is from the Valley of Hinnom, which is which was Jerusalem's garbage dump, where unclean corpses decompo- decomposed and were burned. That's what Yeshua is quoting in Mark 9. And the book of Isaiah depicts God's coming salvation, but it also closes with a strong statement about the judgment of the wicked. And it tells me that during the millennial kingdom, that as people come, somehow they're going to be able to see that judgment. And it's going to remain a warning sign to those on the earth about apostasy, about the price of rebellion. And yet, after Satan gets out of the pit, he still deceives people. It's it's always amazing to me how easy it is for him to deceive humanity. I'm, I'm just astounded. One of the other things that came out as I was studying and doing this is that during this period of time, everything that's happening on the earth, there's a major event that the apostasy will trigger. Revelation 9, verse 1, the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star, an angelic being, that had fallen from heaven to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit, the abyss, was given to him, this fallen angelic being. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke like the smoke of a great furnace flowed out of the pit. Excuse me. And the sun and the atmosphere were darkened by the smoke from the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power to hurt was given to them, like the power which earth scorpions have. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but to hurt only the people who did not have the seal, the mark of ownership or protection of God on their foreheads. They were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment and cause them pain for five months. And their torment was like the torment from a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, people will see death and will not find it. They will long to die to escape the pain, but will discover that death evades them. So the series of things, the domino effect of things that happen to get to this point happen over a period of time. So to get to the falling away from the faith from the world, to get to this place, then the Word of God needs to go silent. Let me say that again. We know that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, word of the Lord. We know that he is the both the living word and the written word. So the word has to go silent. People have to stop teaching it. And then once the church is gone, there will be evangelists left on the earth, the Messianic 144,000. But the word will be gone. They will be the only ones speaking it. But this takes me back to 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. And I know this is serious. This is not something we usually do, have a little fun, preach a little word. We're in serious times here. 
I, I am meeting people all the time, believers that do not know the word, that do not understand what's coming, that are being fooled by the sensational. They don't even know the basics. They don't even know what was taught. This is basic. This isn't advanced. This is basic. So Paul says to Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Messiah Yeshua, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word as an official messenger. Be ready when the time is right and even when it is not right. Keep your sense of urgency. Do you have a sense of urgency right now? If you don't, get one. Whether the opportunity seems favorable or unfavorable, whether convenient or inconvenient, whether welcome or unwelcome, correct those who err in doctrine or behavior, warn those who sin, and exhort and encourage those who are growing towards spiritual maturity with inexhaustible patience and faithful teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine and accurate instruction that challenges them with God's truth, but wanting to have their ears tickled with something pleasing. They will accumulate for themselves many teachers, one after another, chosen to satisfy their own desires and to support the errors they hold, and will turn their ears away from the truth, and will wander off into myth and mad-made fiction, myths, plural, and man-made fiction, and will accept the unacceptable. But as for you, be clear-headed in every situation. Stay calm, cool, and steady. Endure every hardship without flinching. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill the duties of your ministry. Endure every hardship. Have a sense of urgency. Folks, this is written a long time ago. And I see very little urgency. I see people that want their ears tickled. They want to be told. Cotton candy, Christianity. They they don't want meat. They don't want to be convicted. They don't want to be corrected. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. The church, us, the body, must be torn down, unraveled, and stripped of its power and influence before the Antichrist can come to power. You see, he's so arrogant, he can't tolerate disobedience or pushback. His ego is too great for that. Let's jump back to Second Thessalonians 2, verse 4 talking about the man of lawlessness who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and insolently against and over all that is called God or that is worshipped, even to his actually taking his seat in the temple of God and proclaiming himself is God. When the new temple gets built, First of all, the temple's not for us. When the new temple gets built, they need to watch for the Antichrist because he's going to come out, he's going to make his move, and then he's going to walk in and declare himself as God. Now, I said that there are examples of the Antichrist in Scripture. Ezekiel 28 talks about the prince of Tyre. Verse 2, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up, and you have said and thought, I am God. I sit in the seat of the gods, in the heart of the seas, yet you are only a man, weak, feeble, made of earth, and not God. Though you imagine yourself to be almost more than mortal, with your mind as the mind of God. That's a foreshadowing of the satanically empowered Antichrist. Is he alive right now? I believe that he is. Does he know that he is the Antichrist? I don't know. I don't think he's been possessed by Satan as yet. But I believe he's alive. 
I believe that in his own mind he's preparing to come to power. Daniel talks about him again in chapter 11, starting with verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that which is determined by God shall be done. He shall not regard the gods of his father, fathers, or him to whom women desire to give birth, the Messiah, or any other god, for he shall magnify himself above them all. This tells me the Messiah will be of Jewish faith, come out of the Middle East, possibly even have a connection to the Muslim faith. They believe the Mahdi is the Antichrist. That's the least. That's what they're waiting for. He will have appeal to various groups of people. But the Antichrist won't just act like God. He will want to be worshipped as God. And he will have a tremendous ego, as I mentioned before. So Paul tells the church in Thessalonica, Do you not recollect? Don't you remember when I was still with you? I told you these things, almost as if saying, How is it so easy for you to be fooled by these false teachings? And he says, Now you know what is restraining him from being revealed at this time. It is so that he may be manifested, revealed in his own appointed time. There is an appointed time for all of this to happen. Every element must be in place. Something called the fullness of time mentioned in Ephesians 1. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his great pleasure, which he purposed in himself in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Messiah, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Remember that phrase, the fullness of time. In the fullness of time, the church will be removed. In the fullness of time, the man of lawlessness will be revealed. Both coincide. They may even happen simultaneously. It may be a bang, bang. It may happen in the blink of an eye. All of it at once. For the mystery of lawlessness, which is sin, the hidden principle of rebellion against constituted authority, and that authority being God, is already at work in the world. But it is restrained until he who restrains it is taken out of the way. I believe that he is the Holy Spirit and that he is here because the church is here. And if the church is here, the power to restrain this evil is here. Now, is there scripture that tells me that? I believe that there is. Otherwise, I wouldn't have brought it up. We know that the church has been given all power in heaven and earth from the Lord. Luke 4, 36, then they were all amazed. Yeshua had just cast out a demon. They were all amazed and spoke, spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is. For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. Wasn't a ritual. Wasn't some form and formality. There was no water or smoke or anything. He said, come out. They came out. Luke 9, 1, and he called the 12 disciples together. And he did what? He gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Luke ten nineteen. behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Matthew 28, starting verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, what do I call that? 
an implied dispensation, applied transmission of authority, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How? Through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Upper room, Romans eight eleven. The Spirit of him who raised Yeshua from the dead does what? Dwells in you. He who raised Messiah from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit, who what? Dwells in you. As long as the church is here, as long as the upper room power, the dunamis of the church is here, through the Holy Spirit, the Antichrist cannot come to power. You see why it's so important for him to deceive and get the church to sit down and stop doing their job so that he can do his? Verse 8, 2 Thessalonians 2. And then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed. And Adonai Yeshua, the Lord Jesus, will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring him to an end by his appearing as his, at his coming. We're going to see that. Do you realize that we're coming with him in the clouds? We're going to see him speak. And just like he spoke everything into existence, he's going to speak and he's going to destroy them. Isaiah eleven four, But with righteousness and justice shall he judge the poor and decide with fairness for the meek, the poor, and the downtrodden of the earth. And he shall smite the earth and the oppressor with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. I, I don't know about you, but That excites me, not to see people destroyed, but to know that the Word uses the Word to destroy those who defy the Word. The living Word and the written Word speaks, and it is done. But before all of this, the the deception that they are planning to interfere with this must be so great that people fall for it easily. Paul says that in verse 9 of Second Thessalonians 2. The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is through the activity and the workings of Satan and will be attended by great power and with all sorts of pretended miracles and signs and delusive marvels, all of them lying wonders and by unlimited seduction to evil, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, going to perdition, because they did not welcome the truth, capital T, but refused to love it, that they might be saved. Apostasy is a refusal. It's a stepping back. It's a pulling away. You know, if you listen to the recent rewind on Reflections uh, reflections in the Dark from a Cultoberfest 2017, which I posted this weekend, Joe asked me a question about a guy that used to be around called John of God. And during that period of time, he was all over the news. Oprah had him on. She was promoting him. And supposedly, he, he performed miracles by laying hands on people and taking tumors out and diseases out. And he was a fraud. He got arrested. I think he's in jail now. Lying signs and wonders. I know of believers that came to me asking me about this John of God because they wanted to go to him for a miracle. I'm I'm still so astounded that the lack of discerning of spirits that is so prevalent in the church But people will be deceived. Why? Because they refused to welcome the truth to be saved. That's right out of John 3. When the Lord says to Nicodemus, For God so greatly loved and clearly, dearly prized the world that he even gave his own one and only begotten Son, 
so that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge and condemn the world, that is, to initiate the final judgment. His first coming wasn't about the final judgment, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes and has decided to trust in him as personal Savior and Lord is not judged. For this one, that person, there is no judgment. There's no rejection. There's no condemnation. But the one who does not believe and has decided to reject him as personal Savior and Lord is judged already. That one has been convicted and sentenced. Ooh, heavy word. Because he has not believed and trusted in the name of the one and only begotten Son of God. The one who's truly unique. The only one of his kind. The one who alone can save him. And this is the judgment. This is what I'm building up to. This is the cause for the indictment. This is the test by which people are judged, the basis of their self-imposed sentence, that the light has come into the world. And people love darkness rather than the light, for the deeds were evil, for every wrongdoer hates the light and does not come to the light but shrinks away from it for fear that his sinful, worthless activities will be exposed and condemned. But whoever practices truth and does what is right morally, ethically, and spiritually comes to the light so that his works may be clearly shown to be what they are, accomplished in God, divinely prompted, done with God's help, and in dependence, not independent, but in dependence on him. Brothers and sisters, This may be a little dry for you tonight. I love the Word. I could talk the Word. I could read the Word. I love studying. I love doing this. I'm not here to entertain you. While there are times I am entertaining through some of the comments I make or the stumbling over my words because I get excited. This is a serious lesson tonight. And I believe it's time to get serious. We're losing our children to the world. We're losing our children to the enemy. The church is filled with pablum, teachers who want to get pablum. Oh, this is too hard for them to understand. Let's water down the word. I'm not going to water down the word. It's too important. You need the full benefit of the food of the word of God. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 11, Therefore God does what? He sends upon them a misleading influence, a working of error, and a strong delusion to make them believe what is false, in order that they may be judged and condemned who who did not believe in, who refused to adhere to, trust in, and rely on the truth, but instead took pleasure in unrighteousness. People, nobody's tripping into the kingdom. They're not just stumbling. It's not going to just, oh, here I am in the kingdom of God. Wow, I didn't even know. I didn't. How did I get here? No, no, no. It's a decision. It's a decision. They want the truth. They want the freedom. But these that are that that Paul's talking about in Second Thessalonians, they refused to have faith in the Lord. They rejected. Him. I've been around people that do that. I've heard their comments. It's sad, but I won't cajole them into the kingdom. I won't beg them into the kingdom. Please come into the kingdom. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell them the truth. Tell it in love. I'm not going to change the word to suit them. We're in a period of time. We've talked about it before. I'm not sure I'm going to read the whole thing. But at the end of Romans, Paul, which is his final word to the church, by the way, why it's the first one in in 
after the gospel, after Acts, I don't know. It was Paul's final word to the church, a very important word. And if it had been listed as the final word, maybe we would have taken it more seriously about what's going to happen in that period of time when this deception I'm talking about takes over. When people, because they've rejected him as creator, they've refused to honor him as God, they've used, refused to give thanks for his wondrous creation. They became worthless in their thinking, godless, pointless reasoning, silly speculations, and their foolish hearts were hard, darkened and hardened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory and the majesty and excellence of the immortal God for worthless idols, worthless images in the shape of mortal man and birds and four-footed creatures and reptiles. We don't need statues. We don't need icons. So what happens? Because they are not submitted to him, because the Holy Spirit's not working in them, there are no barriers So they get given over to the lust of their hearts, to sexual impurity, to all the things we see on the news, to all the things we see in the world. Degrading vile passions, exchanging their God-given nature for, for other debased things. We're seeing it. You can't turn something on. We, we watch a lot of stuff, my wife and I. And the remote is always nearby. So that if I get an indication of where something's going, I can hit that fast forward button or hit stop. You can't get away from it. They want to inundate you with it. And maybe you're okay. You're strong enough. What about your kids? What are they seeing? What's happening to them? They're being permeated. They're being saturated with every kind of unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, and evil. They're being filled with envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, and mean-spiritedness. Oh, my goodness, you can't watch or see or hear without seeing the mean-spiritedness of mankind. It goes on to say in Romans 1, they become gossips. They spread rumors, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, Spirit of the Antichrist, inventors of new forms of evil, disobedient, disrespectful to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, without pity. Although they know God's righteous decrees and his judgment that those who do such things deserve death, they not only do them, they enthusiastically approve and tolerate others who practice them. Paul is speaking to the church. This is not a book to the world. And what he's saying is that during this period of time, universal, rampant, willful, depraved sin will be present. Is that the key that opens the doorway to the final wave of the demonic? Is that the key? that sets things in motions, that trips the locks on the prison door so that once the church is not here, once the prison guards are gone, once the power that restrains them is gone, it just flows right open. See, this is a slow unraveling. It's taken us a little while to get here. We're just now noticing it more because the dominoes have picked up and they become quicker and they are blurring. We know they're heading towards a conclusion, but it begins slowly. So what's the answer? Paul started out in Romans 1 with the answer. He says it before he goes to this final indictment of what it will be like on the earth. This is where I want to leave it. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation from his wrath and punishment to everyone who believes in Messiah as Savior, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, 
both springing from faith and leading to faith, disclosed in a way that awakens more faith, as it is written and forever remains written. The just and upright shall live by faith. We're in a period of time we need to live by faith, not by feelings, by faith, by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Get in the Word. Don't trust your feelings. Get in the Word. Hear the Word. Listen to praise and worship music that speaks the Word. Because I've been talking to various brothers that I walk with, and they're all hearing the same thing. People are saying it's harder to pray. It's getting harder to hear from the Lord. It's getting harder to get an answer to prayer. Responses are delayed. Well, I know why that is. We're in this period of time. The enemy knows it's their time. They're preparing for their coming out party. Why are we not doing that? Why are we not excited? Why are we not preparing for his coming? Understanding full well that there's another party going on. There's other party goers, demonic ones, fallen angelic ones that are setting up. We need to be knocking down their party. We need to be stopping their party. We need to be interfering with their party. Understanding that this is the time to shine. This is the time to do this. Now next week, and, and I don't know if it will be go, go beyond that, we're going to talk about actual apostasy, things that are being taught right now that are fooling people. We've done this before, but never with the serious tone I, I, I'm feeling right now. Oh, Father, we love you so much. We praise you and worship you. And we know that the enemy does not want this word to go out. They don't want us to live the gospel. They don't want us to be the light. They don't want us to be the salt. They don't want us to cast them out. They don't want us to show the power and the signs of the Messiah. We don't care what they want. We care what you want. So Holy Spirit, speak to us individually and corporately. Speak to us. Show us what we need to read. Show us what we need to do. Show us the basics that we need to focus on, line upon line, precept upon precept. And out of that will come the greater things, the bigger things, the more glamorous things, if you will. Help us to do what you need us to do. Help us to be what we need to be. Because we love you. And we don't want to ever see loved ones fall away. We want them to come towards you. They want, we want them to cling to you. Because of how awesome you are. How wonderful you are. How great and mighty you are. How loving you are. Help us, Lord. I pray all these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift. lift. <laughs> May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, give you shalom. I'm Richard Grund. This has been The Porch on Firefall Talk Radio.